Thank Tomas for the invita invitation to come up. Uh, I was trying to count over the past five or ten years, I think this is the third or fourth time I've come up uh, to, to McGill to talk on various subjects, invited by Alberto or uh, Tomas. Uh, and one of the things I always enjoy doing while I'm up here is I've been working for many years now on a project on the early history of cardiac surgery. And one of the most interesting figures in that history is Arthur Weinberg, who was here at McGill for many years, who was a total pack rat, who has one of the largest and most complete archives I have ever found. That's at the Osler Library. Uh, and apparently no one has done a, a thorough study of that archive. So there's a lot of material that no one has ever looked at before. Uh, but the thing that has been even better yesterday and today uh, is getting to talk with many of the surgeons here who, who knew Weinberg. Uh, and so I've been busily collecting stories off the record. Don't, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> but it's a really wonderful opportunity as a historian to be able to hear these stories from people uh, who can provide insights into a person that you can't get from reading his hundreds of publications. Uh, <coughs> let me add happy to talk about that, but Thomas asked me to talk about a different subject. Uh, and so as, as a historian and also as a surgical patient, I've long been interested in how surgical decisions get made. How do we know what we know about the efficacy and adverse effects of surgical procedures? How confident are we that this knowledge is correct? And then how does that knowledge of efficacy and safety, combined with many, many other factors, then produce the actual surgical decisions that get made? And so last year, in the earlier version of this conference, I spoke about a particular case study about these debates about whether the switch to minimally invasive coronary artery bypass grafting uh, would reduce the risk of what's been called pump head, the cerebral complications of cardiac surgery. And it's an interesting case study because on the basis of disease mechanisms and knowledge of what heart-lung machines do to the circulation, going back decades, people really, really believe that the switch to minimally invasive cabbage ought to reduce the cerebral complications. But then as the clinical trials have come out over the past 10 or 15 years, they really haven't shown that consistently. So it's this case where you have this mismatch between what ought to happen and then what seems to happen. And so it raises these debates. Is the problem the models of disease? Is the problem in the clinical trials? And these debates are, are ongoing actively today. But this year, Thomas gave me a much broader mandate to discuss the history of clinical trials uh, in surgery. Uh, and so I've been busily uh, revising what I've been planning to say in light of the excellent talks uh, that we've had both yesterday uh, and today. Uh, the, yesterday we heard a lot about knowledge production in 19th century surgery, which was really sort of stuff I had an inkling of but hadn't understood so thoroughly. Uh, and so that has been very useful to change how I'm thinking about this. And then Chris was just talking about the ethics uh, of, and practice of sham surgery trials. Uh, fortunately, Chris and I were able to compare notes over the weekend. Uh, so you'll see there's very slight uh, overlap, but really I think our two talks will complement uh, each other well. So I'll zoom out from that story that Chris was just talking about and look at some of the much broader contexts. Now the usual story, which you will hear time and time again, is that surgeons have not gotten onto the randomized clinical trial bandwagon uh, the way that they, either they ought to have or that other physicians have done. And many people have looked at this uh, Richard Horton has looked at this with the best title, Surgical Research or Comic Opera. Uh, and it was, it, the, for the historians of medicine here, uh, people are cranky at Richard Horton, uh, who launched a totally uh, unwarranted and uh, random attack on history of medicine a couple years ago. Uh, pleased to see that he has also launched such random attacks against <laughs> surgeons. It's not just historians of medicine. Uh, but what he did is he looked at the sample of leading surgical journals in 1996. He looked at the first issue of nine different journals, found 175 reports of original research. Of those, 46% were case series, 18% were animal studies, and only 12% were randomized clinical trials. Uh, and he said, you know, there's clearly something wrong with surgical research. And you can find dozens and dozens and dozens of studies like this, saying like basically what is wrong with surgeons. And so as a historian, I've been interested in why is this the case that randomized clinical trials haven't been picked up in the same way? Uh, so there's a historical analysis that I will sketch out today. I can't obviously go into full details in the time that I have. But then it also raises an interesting question for people who are actively surgeons or people who are involved in policy. Should it be this way? Is it actually a problem that surgeons haven't picked up trials in the same way? Uh, 
Uh, and I regret about that, that John Kimmelman couldn't be here. He's, he's teaching this morning. Uh, <clears throat> because so, some of what I will say here will address his talk directly. I was, I was able to flush this out with him last night. Uh, and so I think we, we have a mutual understanding of how this fits together. Uh, but my basic either argument or hypothesis, depending on how ambitious I'm feeling about this, uh, is that randomized clinical trials have played a fundamentally different role uh, in medicine and surgery. It's almost a case of apples and oranges. Uh, in medicine, for a variety of reasons, randomized clinical trials have served to prove that a treatment works in order to gain access to the market. Uh, in surgery, there are some cases where that has happened. But for the most part, randomized clinical tri trials have functioned to, re to remove an already discredited procedure from the market. Uh, and this difference reflects two, under, at least two, these are the two I've thought of so far, underlying fundamental differences. Uh, one is the presumed efficacy of surgical procedures, which happens for a variety of reasons. And then the other is that there's essentially no regulatory obstacle to new surgical procedures. Devices, yes, sort of, de devices are complicated, but for new operations, uh, you, you can just introduce them as long as you have the blessing of your chair or the hospital surgical committee. Uh, and so as a result of these differences, uh, and there, there are exceptions. Uh, I'll be curious to hear other e examples of exceptions that you all have. But for the most part, mm -hmm. RCTs have been invoked late in the development of operations uh, to prove lack of eff efficacy already when there's considerable skepticism of them. <coughs> so the, just to fill in some of the background, this is material I had uh, planned to say much about, but the people who spoke yesterday have saved me most of this work, uh, have saved me most of this work. As, it's been, as it was described, uh, surgeons and physicians had long relied on case series, but there's a several hundred year history of people becoming skeptical of the traditional methods because of bias, because of enthusiasm. Uh, and so you start to see the elaboration of much more developed, uh, sophisticated modes of evaluation, including blinding, controls, randomization. The Medical Research Council puts them into the elaborate form of the randomized clinical trial in the 1940s. The streptomycin trial may or may not have been the first one. There was an earlier trial of patulin uh, for the common cold. Uh, initially in the US, there's a mix of skepticism and enthusiasm in the 1950s. Uh, US researchers are like the idea. They're concerned that they're hard to do. They're concerned about these ethics of these things. The main people who push them are people who are pushing them motivated by anxiety about the influence of the pharmaceutical industry. In the 1950s, the medical marketplace was flooded with new uh, pharmaceuticals, new classes of drugs. Therapeutic reformers wanted to t somehow contain this. Um, <clears throat> their efforts to impose RCTs uh, really were going nowhere uh, until the thalidomide scandal jump-started the Kefauer-Harris amendments. Uh, 1962, the, in the US, the amendments to the Food and Drug Act are passed. Uh, people will often say, well, it was in 1962 that RCTs got the mandate as the, the guardian of the pharmaceutical marketplace. That's not quite right. Uh, it wasn't until the law was reinterpreted in 1970 that the FDA implemented its requirement of randomized clinical trials, and then Europe and Japan followed suit. Um, and as this described, now and there are literally thousands of trials, millions of patients, billions of dollars. It's a huge industry to, to do this of evidence-based medicine. Even in the pharmaceutical domain, it's complicated. <coughs> uh, people understand that RCTs are one mode of knowledge production. Other ones are still used. Uh, there's been a lot of pushback against evidence-based medicine. This was a, a famous one from British Medical Journal in 1999 that talked about eminence-based medicine, vehemence-based medicine, confidence-based medicine that was limited to surgeons. Uh, so this, this notion of RCTs as a gold standard uh, has been a contested one within pharmaceuticals. <coughs> and all of this work uh, has there's been a boondoggle for people who are interested in history and anthropology of science, and there's been an immense amount of very interesting work that's been done uh, to understand what has gone on with clinical trials. Uh, historians have looked at the arguments that therapeutic reformers have made to try to put these things on the market. They've looked at the complex social and institutional arrangements that are required to actually conduct a clinical trial. Uh, they've described the tensions that physicians have felt between individual judgment and the kind of standardized logic that clinical trials <coughs> impose. There's been a lot written about the many controversies that have consumed almost every prominent trial that has been done, uh, and a lot of work on the role of the pharmaceutical industry. And recently, again, as was mentioned briefly yesterday, there's been a huge offshoring of clinical research, very high percent of clinical research now, 
uh, is done outside of North America and Western Europe, and a lot of concerns about the ethics of that. Uh, and the bottom line of, or one of the main conclusions of a lot of this work by the social scientists has been that randomized clinical trials shouldn't be seen as a scientific method. They should be seen as a social and political process. Uh, even though they're designed to resolve controversies, they more often reflect and even propagate these controversies. So there's this very nuanced body of literature about clinical trials. <clears throat> Most of this ignores surgery. If like you look at a lot of those books, and you, you, surgery doesn't even make it into the index of many of these books. Uh, and there's some work uh, by Tomas and by others uh, who have looked at specific aspects of the history of, of surgery. Tomas's interpretation of the role of evidence uh, in the case of the Swiss uh, bone internal fixers. I'm not sure what the, the verb for that is. And I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the name of the AO collaboration uh, in the presence of two uh, native speakers. Uh, but this was, you know, Tomas says, uh, one of his conclusions, in, in the case of the AO technique, the fact that research was being done at all was enough to establish credibility. The actual results of the research were only of secondary importance, considering that the average surgeon had too little time in his schedule to read and re evaluate the results of the research anyway. Uh, so he, as he describes in more detail that, you know, the AO's vision was to have, they didn't want to do a randomized clinical trial, they wanted to have a comprehensive registry of every patient who had ever had the procedure done. And the argument would be that if you had this data, you could produce good knowledge. Uh, but they never managed to do that. Uh, didn't really matter. Just the fact that they were trying gave them the credibility they had to, to contribute to the successful launch of this technique. Uh, but it's clear that, you know, that even from this work that has been done, that surgical trials have been done. They've been important. And they're really, really interesting. And it's a huge missed opportunity uh, that people haven't done more work on this. Uh, as I said, I can't possibly address that entire void in the literature uh, in half an hour. I just want to sketch out some of the basic details. Uh, and so as Ulrich described yesterday, you know, surgeons had turned to evidence, including statistics, in the 18th or 19th century to try to figure out what was going on with some of these procedures. Uh, but even though that turn to statistics had taken place a long time ago, you'll still see prominent statements uh, from the mid-20th century. This is by Sir Max Page, president of the surgery section of surgery of the Royal Society of Medicine. In the course of its rapid development, modern surgery has been over-dependent on judgments tinctured by emotional reactions common to mankind, and that it has largely failed to utilize statistical research. Uh, and so surgeons, again, were aware of this problem. They were condemning themselves. Uh, if you actually look at what he recommends, he's not recommending randomized clinical trials. And you know, this was 1947. Uh, the MRC was in the midst of very large and influential trials. He was, must have been aware of this. Now, that's not what he's recommending for surgery. Uh, he just wants better record keeping. Uh, he wants you know, standardized operative forms so that people could then do re retrospective uh, collation of data and produce it. So even though he wants statistical methods, what he actually wants is a very modest form of retrospective research. Again, not too different from what was going on in principle in the 18th and 19th centuries. <clears throat> now, trials did start to happen. Uh, and I'm loath to assert of a claim about what was the first trial. Uh, Many people are willing to do that, and most of those claims turn out to be wrong. Uh, many of them uh, will say that this was, this was the first surgical RCT, uh, a study that was done. Uh, it was begun in 1959, uh, published in the British Medical Journal in 1964, uh, comparing three different surgical procedures uh, of, for treatment of peptic ulcer disease. Uh, it was randomized. Uh, what, it was an interesting process. Uh, you know, the surgeons are always saying you have to be, pay attention to patient individuality. So we, we have these three procedures, but it's not the case that any patient could have each of these three procedures. And so they said you, you, can't, you couldn't randomize the patients until you had opened them up to see exactly where on the stomach the ulcer was sitting. Uh, and so the protocol that they put in place uh, is they told patients they were going to be part of this study. Uh, they took them to the OR, did the laparotomy, the surgeon inspected the stomach, found out where the ulcer was. Uh, if it was an anatomy that required one of those types of surgery, the patient would be withdrawn from the study and the surgeon would do the appropriate surgery. If the surgeon decided that this patient might be able to have any of these three procedures, that's when their patient was randomized. The surgeon was given an envelope and would do the procedure that the envelope revealed them to do, uh, which is an interesting way to do it. Uh, published in 1964. 
Uh, and so this does have, no, it's not a sham. There was no placebo arm, there was no sham arm. It was controlling, comparing three active surgeries. Uh, but this trial has most of the bells and whistles of what people would consider a moder modern randomized uh, controlled trial. Started in 1959, ended in 1964. <clears throat> if you look more broadly, uh, you see a much longer and more complicated history. Uh, and it, you get into these questions of you know, what counts or not as a modern clinical trial. Uh, the earliest one I've seen uh, was published in, first published in 1922. It's not clear when they started doing enrolling patients for this, but it couldn't have been much before 1920. And this was in response to the work of Henry Cotton, uh, who is the director of the asylum uh, in the Trenton State Hospital in New Jersey. There's a very interesting muckraking expose by uh, Andrew Skull about the history of Henry Cotton uh, called Madhouse. But Cotton believed that psychosis was caused by focal infection. And so if you went in surgery surgically and rooted out these sources of infection, you could control psychosis. Uh, and he started with dental work. Uh, and so pulling abscessed teeth, uh, and then became more ambitious from there. Uh, and by, by the early 1920s, he was doing colectomies, uh, because it turns out if you swabbed people's colons, they had bacteria. Uh, and that could be a source of infection that was causing psychosis. So he was doing colectomy uh, and was reporting cure rates of 80 to 90 percent. And people who had worked with him were suspicious of that because his operative mortality rates were 30 to 35 percent. It's like, you can't be curing 80 percent if you're losing a third of your patients on the table in the OR. Uh, and so various people who were aware of what was going on uh, did investigations of his work. Uh, there was one in investigation, the one that Skull describes, uh, where a uh, young woman psychiatrist was sent to basically to do a chart review of Cotton's work, uh, documented how badly it was going, but that report was squashed uh, for a variety, variety, variety of reasons. But then a group at the New York Psychiatric Institute actually did a study of this. Uh, it was alternate allocation. Uh, it wasn't randomized. Uh, <coughs> the Austin Bradford Hill and others debated a lot in this period, 1920s, 1930s, of the relative merits of alternate allocation and randomization. And there are very subtle reasons why randomization is a superior technique. Uh, but you know, they, they did an alternate allocation study uh, and found that, sure enough, surgery for focal infection did not help these patients uh, with psychosis. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's a gap. And then you st they, they start to show up again in the 1950s. Uh, you see a study that was done in, uh, in Sweden on angina pectoris doing ganglionectomy. It was one of the techniques of, to interrupt the sympathetic nervous system, to disrupt sympathetic driving of the heart, to reduce workload, to treat angina. Uh, again, not randomized. Uh, she just compared two groups of patients. And patients would come in, some were referred for surgery, some were not operated on, and she just prospectively looked at them. Uh, the VA system in the U.S. did a study of schizophrenia, uh, started in 1950, published in 1959. Again, alternate allocation. Uh, they, again, they weren't aware of the subtle benefits you would get from having done randomization. One of the ironies of that study is they actually showed it was a positive trial. Uh, it did show efficacy on their primary outcomes of lobotomy for schizophrenia. But by the time it was published, uh, chlorpromazine had come into wide use. So it was a case that no one really cared about the results of this study. Uh, Study in 1951, started the next year, uh, done by, I think it was a, again, a Finnish group uh, on breast cancer. <coughs> I'll, I'll come back to this. Hmm? The, I'll, I'll come back to this study in more detail in a bit. Again, alternate allocation studies. Uh, and as far as I can tell, uh, what may be the first randomized studies were the ones that Chris talked about. Uh, so this one that I mentioned, this, this one that everyone credits as the first randomized trial was started in 1959. Uh, as Chris had said, the two IMA ligation studies were reported at the medical meetings in 1958, so presumably they had been started in 57 or 58. Uh, both of those were randomized. Both of them were sham controlled. Uh, so as far as I can now, again, I'm not going to make a strong claim of the first, but I think the, the IMA ligation studies were the first randomized uh, trials, not just the first sham trials. And then in parallel, surgeons were also doing lots of studies, not of surgical techniques, but of the medications and other things that surgeons do to patients as part of surgery. Uh, Beecher was involved uh, in a study of antiemetics, uh, different drugs, and interesting, including chlor chlorpromazine. It was one of the first studies using chlorpromazine in the US as an antiemetic, not as an antipsychotic. Uh, and then there was another study that was done uh, trying to use different drugs to control operative bleeding. So surgeons were doing 
uh, randomized studies, not just of surgical techniques, but also of medicines that were part of what John referred to yesterday as the intervention ensemble. And so there are two interesting issues with this work in the 1950s. Uh, one was, again, especially with the, the trials of internal mammary artery ligation uh, with the sham controls. And surgeon, some surgeons, not all surgeons, some surgeons were all in. They were really willing to do this method at the extreme level needed to get uh, really high-end methodological design, randomization, sham controlled. Now, th these were very small studies, you know, a couple dozen patients. Uh, but still, there were people at the beginning who were so committed to this method that they were willing to do sham controlled trials. Uh, but then the other thing that you see is many of these early trials are not done to prove the value of a new innovation, uh, but they're done in the setting of skepticism to take an existing uh, intervention off the market. Uh, and then for, by the time you get to 1960, the, the method is really settling, settling in. And by 1966, you see a huge spike uh, in con con randomized controlled trials of surgical procedures. And they have trickled along since that time. <clears throat> One of the things that happens to make this method particularly relevant uh, is that surgery, especially in the, in the US, and possibly uniquely in the US, uh, becomes under incredible critical scrutiny in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And there, there are a variety of reasons for this. Uh, one is that with the enactment of Medicare uh, and fee-for-service surgery, money just poured into US healthcare system. A lot of that was going into surgeons. Uh, as Francis Moore, who is head of surgery at the Peter Brent Brigham Hospital said, uh, that uh, with a fee-for-service system, uh, the American population, for, not just for surgeons, also for pediatricians and everyone else, is a happy hunting ground, uh, was the phrase that he had used. And so there's this concern about rapidly increasing costs of healthcare. Uh, and then in the setting of that, people, as people start looking more closely at surgery, uh, there are these reports that start to get prominent attention of geographic variation. Now, geographic variation had been famously described, described by Glover back in 1938. There had been another study of appendectomy in upstate New York in 1952. Neither of those studies gets much attention. But starting in about 1965, there are a whole series of reports of geographic variation in surgery that actually do get traction. Uh, there's this one of appendectomy rates in Hanover, and then what becomes the most famous work by John Wenberg and Alan Gittleson, first of Vermont, then of Maine, and now with the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare, looking at national data. Uh, and they show that there's enormous variation over small geographic area in the practice of surgery. <clears throat> rates varied between countries, rates varied within countries, rates even varied within cities. And for the most part, there was no good explanation for this. It was not a case of surgeons reflecting the burden of disease. It was other things that were going on. Uh, whether, whether it was local standards of practice because of the role of an influential chair of surgery in a community, whether it was financial conflicts of interest, whether it was supplier-induced demand. There were many proposals that were put on the table, uh, and none of them reflected well on the practice of surgery. And many of these researchers uh, converged at Harvard in the early 1970s. Wenberg was there, John Bunker uh, was there. Bunker had done a famous study of surgical manpower, showing that the surgeon rate per capita in the US was far higher than it was in the UK and Canada, and so therefore you should not be surprised that surgery rates were far higher uh, in the US than the UK and Canada, and maybe the US needed to do something uh, to stop this oversupply of surgeons. And so they converged at Harvard in 1972. The School of Public Health uh, had established the Center for An Analysis of Health Practices, and they established a working group on surgery that meets for several years, uh, and then produces this book in 1977, The Cost, Risks, Benefits of Surgery. For people who are in health systems research in the US, this is really seen as a hallmark book that really establishes what could be done by a thoughtful, critical uh, group of researchers inter interested in this problem. Uh, Howard Hyatt, uh, who's still active, he's still one of my colleagues, was dean of the School of Public Health at that time. Uh, and this was in his preface, he says, we require both better understanding of the natural history of diseases treated surgically and more accurate appraisal of the potential benefits and limitations of surgical intervention. And if you look at this book, uh, some of these early clinical trials that Chris had described play a really prominent role in helping these people make the case that there's a real problem here that we need to figure out. Uh, the basic theme of a lot of these studies is that surgical practice in the United States is out of control. It needs to be put back under control. 
and that randomized clinical trials are a really useful way of doing this for surgery. And so there's a great essay about the rise and fall of internal mammary arterial ligation, uh, which really happens in the US over a three year period between 1957 and 1960. This conclusion about those trials that Chris described, the, by questioning the reliability of the usual clinical evaluation of any operation designed to relieve angina, the demand for properly controlled studies gained impetus and spread to other surgical and medical procedures. So he said, you know, those two IMA ligation studies were seen as an important precedent. The short life cycle is a vivid demonstration of the efficacy of a properly designed study and answering difficult questions about the value of a surgical procedure. And so it's an interesting comment. It's not about the efficacy of the procedure. It's about the efficacy of a trial of a procedure to impact surgical practice. They have a case study of the gastric freezing for peptic ulcer disease, which went through the seven year life cycle, uh, and same sort of conclusion. The process, talking about the 1969 clinical trial, is an example of the medical profession successfully evaluating and regulating the use of its own innovative treatments. So in this period in the early 1970s, there was great confidence in the ability of randomized clinical trials to have an impact on these two procedures. But as people look at this, more carefully, they start to realize it's not quite so clear cut. <clears throat> so Harvey Feinberg, uh, who goes on to have a very prominent career uh, in American medicine, was involved in another group through the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences that was looking at healthcare di health technology diffusion. Uh, and he essentially does a reanalysis of the gastric freezing study. And he said, you know, after the initial enthusiasm in 1962, prompted by Wangenstein's first publication, the, pretty soon the company had distributed 1,500 of these machines, it was being widely used. But by 1963, there was already serious skepticism just based on people who had used this. And people do animal studies, uh, and their experience was the only thing that you were actually freezing with this procedure were the gastric contents. And if you looked at what happened, you would end up like with a frozen shell of gastric bile around the balloon that actually insulated the rest of the stomach from this device. And in fact, that was a good thing because if the device had actually been freezing the gastric mucosa, you'd get necrosis and ulcers. Uh, and so these are the sorts of claims that were made. Uh, but of course, these claims were actively rebutted. Wangenstein said, we'll, we'll do more studies, we'll figure this out. There are so many different parameters. How cold do you cool the alcohol? How long do you do it for? How, how much do you inflate the balloon? Uh, there are many, many things that Wangenstein wanted to study. Um, and he continues actively to do studies into the late 60s, but by 1965, the procedure had more or less fallen flat. There'd been some very small studies that Chris had mentioned that got published. But the big study, the decisive study, gets published in 1969, and by that point, no one had really been doing the procedure for four years. So this is Feinberg's uh, conclusion. I think this is a very nice quotation. The report, this is the 1969 RCT, was unequivocal in its negative conclusions, but of little practical consequence as if a marble tombstone were erected over the grave of a patient already several years deceased. And so yeah, there's this uncertainty in the field. You know, had these RCTs been decisive or had they not had much of an impact at all? And the history uh, of breast cancer surgery is, is really informative uh, in this regard. Uh, so as well known, Halstead described radical mastectomy in 1882 becomes a popular procedure, but comes under heavy critique by the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, this was not a universally beloved procedure by anyone who was involved. Uh, the, this, was a, this wasn't my work, this is the work of Baron Lerner, a historian of Columbia. As far as he can tell, the first call for a randomized trial of mastectomy comes in 1942 from Ira Ravden, who becomes the chair of surgery at UPenn. So 1942, a very early call that we need to do a randomized trial of radical mastectomy uh, versus simple or total mastectomy. Um, that's not done right away. Uh, in the post-war period, there's actually a moment where American surgeons double down, not just on radical mastectomy, but on extended radical mastectomy, making the procedures even more aggressive than they had been before. Uh, and this mix of discon long-standing discontent and then even more extreme surgery by the surgeons uh, fuels a sustained controversy from the 50s, really into the early 1980s. Uh, where initially what happens is you now people are publishing competing case series. There are people who are pu publishing very large case series claiming that radical mastectomy works, controlled in various inadequate ways, and then skeptics are publishing their own case series claiming that simple mastectomy works, 
again, controlled in various inadequate ways. Uh, Michael Shimkin published this editorial in JAMA in 1961, uh, where he said, look, you know, we, we really don't know what's going on. We need to do good trials. Uh, he reviewed data from one of these interesting you know, sort of natural history experiments. Uh, he had data from a community, I was in Illinois in the United States, during World War II, where the good surgeons had been drafted. Uh, and so there was this period where the people in this community didn't have access to surgeons brave enough to do radical mastectomies. So for a three-year window, all the women diagnosed with breast cancer were getting simple mastectomies. Uh, and so there was this three-year cohort of simple mastectomies. He saw it as essentially a pseudo-randomized design. It was by chance whether you were presented in 43 versus 46. Uh, and so was able to look at uh, this retrospective pseudo-cohort -co analysis and had data showing that there, there really wasn't any difference in survival, whether people had had radical mastectomy by a trained surgeon before the war or after the war, or simple mastectomy by a family practice guy during the war. And she said, we really need to have trials. Uh, and you know, surgeons didn't always agree. Uh, Roald Grant, a surgeon at the American Cancer Society, in response to this, said that scientific trials, or randomized trials of breast cancer were scientific Russian roulette, again, sort of the concern about gambling and random randomization and playing chance, uh, and go so far as comparing it to Nazi experimentation during World War II. Uh, so there was no holding back on the rhetoric in this debate. Uh, and to be fair, uh, Barney Kreil and the skeptics of mastectomy didn't want to do clinical trials either. They were just as convinced that they were right. Uh, Kreil saw, that, saw no need for randomization. People just needed to believe his case series and stop doing radical mastectomy. <clears throat> now the trials are done. Uh, as I had mentioned, there had been the study that had been started in 1951, uh, so very early in these debates. So uh, Bravden had called for clinical trials in 1942. Shimkin calls for clinical trials in 1961. In the middle of that window, this study had been done of simple mastectomy plus radiation versus extended radical mastectomy. Uh, in 1965, they published 10-year follow-ups, and this is a robust uh, period of follow-up, uh, showing no benefit. Another study uh, uh, had been done, published in 1966, comparing uh, simple versus radical mastectomy. And both groups had gotten radiation. Again, five-year follow-up had shown no benefit. Uh, and so these studies come out, are published uh, in the English language literature in the mid-1960s. And yet by 1970, 80% of women in the US are still getting radical mastectomy. Uh, and as people uh, observed, you know, it's evident that these conclusions were not widely agreed upon. So the trials were out. The trials are not having an impact on American practice. Uh, there was lots of speculation about why it was uh, that these trials were ignored. This is by a comment by Clem McPherson, who was one of the people who was involved in that Harvard working group in the early 1970s. Uh, he said, you know, one explanation is that this relates to the models of disease. So if you're a kind of surgeon who believes that all cancer must be removed as early and aggressively as possible, you're going to want to do a radical or an extended radical mastectomy. Uh, and maybe that's what was going on. Uh, but then he also observed, uh, not too strongly, but he did observe that surgeons' fees for radical mastectomy were twice as high as they were for simple mastectomy. Uh, so maybe surgeons had a massive financial conflict of interest in doing this. Uh, and then Bernard Fisher enters the scene. Uh, there are a load of very colorful comments from Fisher about all of this. Uh, this was a comment from one of the American Cancer Society meetings, 1970. I believe that all of us must get these clinical trials done as quickly as possible and not sit on our butts and continue year after year to go through the same type of masturbation. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he and others establish uh, the NSABP program and start doing a series of clinical trials. And these are the ones that get the most attention. BO4 launched in 71 and BO6 launched in 1976. Uh, and often the story that's told is that you, you see a radical impact uh, by if 50, half of American women were getting radical mastectomies in 1972, it's down to 3% by 1981. But again, as with the gastric freezing, if you actually look at the timing of this, most of the decline in, or most of the shift in practice in the US occurs before the major results of these studies come out. Uh, so Baron Warner, who has looked at this history 
in detail, basically concludes that these trials didn't have that much impact on thinking or practice. Uh, they mostly corroborated existing knowledge. Uh, and there are many uh, stories about what was going on here. Was this a generational shift that as young surgeons came in, uh, radical mastectomy wasn't picked up by them, and so it disappeared from practice? Other people have said this was driven by patient practice, shifts in how much agency women were given in making these decisions. As women start advocating against radical mastectomy, that forces surgeons' hands in some ways in the 1970s. So there are lots of explanations of what happened, but it's not the case that these trials had a decisive impact. The impact had happened uh, while the trials were underway. And so again, it's the case that the clinical trials didn't discredit radical mastectomy, but were in some way a, fi a fi final nail in the coffin of the sort that Vine uh, Feinberg had mentioned previously. Now in the midst of this, so this is published in 1981, uh, John McKinley it was a very, really interesting guy, an epidemi epidemiologist uh, who's gone back and forth between Boston University and Harvard over the course of his career, uh, published this analysis of the natural history of medical innovations. And it's a highly sch schematic uh, model. But it's actually a, a, a fun one to work with. You can go through any innovation uh, and sort of trace how well it follows through his seven stages from promising report, gets adopted, gets funded by insurers, whether state or private, becomes a standard procedure. Uh, and then he'll describe relatively late in the process, you get a randomized clinical trial. Uh, inevitably, the clinical trial will get den denounced by defenders of the procedure. Uh, and so the, the stage of pro professional denunciation isn't denunciation of the remedy, it's denunciation of the clinical trial. Uh, but eventually, uh, the clinical trials went out and the procedures are eroded and discredited. And he has a whole series of examples of past and current in 1981 procedures and how they fall on this time course. Uh, and his most often used example for this was coronary artery bypass grafting. Uh, and so writing in 1981, uh, it's interesting, he puts it at stage four, although he knew that some of the randomized trials had already come out, uh, but he thought that it was inevitable that eventually there would be randomized clinical trials of bypass surgery, and then the same thing would happen as happened with mastectomy, gastric freezing, and internal mammary artery ligation. Eventually, these trials would show that the procedure doesn't work and lead to erosion and discreditation of the procedure, uh, and that's not exactly what has happened. Uh, and so I'll just I'll review this history briefly. I've, I've written a lot about it elsewhere. Uh, the coronary artery bypass surgery had really burst onto the scene in 1968, courtesy of work by people in Cleveland and elsewhere. Uh, and by 1977, it becomes uh, the most frequently performed major surgical procedure in the United States. Uh, it was never as popular in Canada, and it was never nearly as popular in England for a variety of reasons, uh, but it becomes a huge industry in the United States. Skeptics immediately call for trials. Uh, the two main figures in this were Thomas Chalmers, who had been a wide, uh, who it was in, engaged actively in many fields of medicine in the 1970s, calling for randomization. And his famous phrase was for randomization of the first patient. The most active protagonist uh, in the bypass surgery debate was one of his students, David Spodek, who was a cardiologist in Boston, who published dozens and dozens of dozens of letters in journals in medicine, cardiology, and surgery, complaining about the lack of randomized trials. Uh, and he writes that somehow the mystique of surgery, the presumed efficacy of a mechanical rearrangement of tissue makes these natural referees, the journal reviewers, uh, suspend disbelief in a way that no pill could. And so the fact that it was just so obvious uh, the bypass worked, you know, if you just look at this procedure, how could that not help someone who has focal plaques in their coronary arteries? Uh, the obviousness, the obviousness of the procedure, the mystique of the surgery, allows this procedure to thrive in the absence of evidence. Trials are eventually done. The, the VA system starts a trial. It's interesting, the trial actually starts as a trial of Weinberg implants. Uh, and they start enrolling patients with Weinberg implants in 69 and 1970. They quickly realize that no one cares about Weinberg implants anymore, and they just switch the trial pr protocol over to bypass surgery, uh, enroll patients starting from 72 to 74, publish the results. Uh, and you can see there's, there's not a lot of separation between those two curves of so the patients treated surgically and the patient treated medically. Uh, their conclusion was that there was some efficacy, meaning prolongation of survival, for the sickest patients, patients who have three vessel disease or left main disease, but for most of the patients, there was no difference in medicine. Uh, 
And this just caused a sort of a bomb of controversy uh, in the field. People argued that you know, the trial wasn't well done, that the VA surgeons were incompetent, that if Denton Cooley had done the trial, he would have, got, he would have shown how superior this procedure could be. It went on and on and on. Uh, and the trial mostly had very little impact. You have to look hard to find any evidence of an impact of this trial. I did find one. This is from the archives of the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and this is the net income of the Department of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. Uh, in the winter of 77, 78. One of the things that's impressive is how high the income was. Uh, and that, that income, several hundred thousand dollars a month uh, in income for this department. Uh, we had only very few surgeons who were operating then. And you do see this huge dip. The, the, their income plummets over the winter uh, in February, uh, January, February of 1978. And as you can see, you can't quite read it out. The two things that are written in, I don't know whose handwriting that is, but it was whoever, it was either, I think it was, it couldn't have been Effler because he had left by then. Uh, I'll have to see if I can figure out who it was. But one of them is VA. So that's a reference to the VA trial. And their complaint was the VA trial briefly damped enthusiasm for this procedure. And then the other one is winter. There was a big blizzard that had shut down Cleveland's, the Cleveland Clinic ORs for a week. And so those two things, the blizzard and the VA trial, had a huge bump in their impact. But then it quickly recovers uh, and cont continues to go and continues to increase until eventually they lose market share to angioplasty. And instead of having a big impact on bypass surgery, uh, what you see is that even the thought of doing the trials, and then when the trials are actually done, has a huge impact on perceptions of the utility of randomized clinical trials. Uh, and so you see every time Chalmers or Spodek or anyone else, Eugene Brownwald, would write a paper calling for trials, there'd be a very aggressive response explaining why trials were not the thing to do. Uh, Jack Love, who is on the editorial board of JAMA, responds to Spodek saying, look, you know, operations are different. Uh, Surgeon skill varies from person to person. Operations involve hundreds of details. The procedures are constantly changing. There's no way you could do a good trial. Uh, a few years later, Lawrence Bonchek, writing the New England Journal of Medicine, says, look, you know, drugs are stable compounds. The effectiveness of a drug is unrelated to physician skill. It's actually an interesting question whether or not that's true. Uh, whereas new operations, it's clearly not the case. Uh, and in fact, what he argues is that if you have a new procedure, you want it dispersed across the market as widely as possible because you want as many surgeons as possible early on innovating with a procedure on the hopes of finding the, the best form of the procedure as quickly as possible. So it was basically a call for immediate dissemination of experimental operations as part of a sort of mass optimization of the surgical protocol. Uh, and then he says, you know, we should resist the almost religious fervor of those who would sanctify randomized studies as the only means of learning the truth. Modern medical therapy is sufficiently sophisticated so that only physiologically sound operations achieve wide use. Uh, and very interesting claims. You could argue about whether or not that's true. But it was clear by, 19, by the end of the 1970s uh, that in bypass surgery and in other cases where surgeons had confidence in their procedures, the randomized clinical trials just did not have that much impact. Many of the operations, like cabbage, had a high a priori assumption of efficacy. Uh, surgeons were confident that they could refine these procedures through case series and constant innovation. And when everything lined up, when the physiological expectations and the data from case series both pointed in the right direction, as surgeons said they did for bypass surgery, then everything was fine. There was no concern within the field of surgery that you needed to do these studies. Uh, because of that confidence, and then beca because of the methodological limitations of clinical trials, which surgeons delineated in great detail in the early, 19, early to mid-1970s, there just wasn't a lot of enthusiasm among surgeons for these procedures. And so as a result, the clinical trials, and again, I, I assume there are exceptions to this. I'm trying to find these. But RCTs have been done late in the procedure only when there is skepticism. And so the RCTs have more or less functioned uh, as a hitman for selected vulnerable operations have been deployed selectively in the setting of vulnerability, and that's where they have worked. And elsewhere, they haven't had a huge impact on surgical practice. Uh, and I'd be very e eager to hear examples of where I'm wrong about that. Uh, so fast forward from late 1970s to the present. What do you see? Uh, as I said early on, you see endless reports of people complaining about the lack of clinical trials in surgery. 
This was one that was published 2003, looking 1966 to 2000 across major surgical journals. Somewhere between 1.9 and 4% of the articles were randomized clinical trials. So again, not enough clinical trials are being done. There have been many, many thoughtful observers describing the limitations of the approach. Uh, I suspect some of you know this guy, McLeod, who's a surgeon in Toronto. At least every other year or so, he publishes another version of this article. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, for 20 years now, going back to the 1990s, uh, listing the many factors uh, that distinguish surgery from other kinds of medicine. Almost all of these had been described in the 1970s, and so it's really just you know, repackaging something that surgeons have known for a long time. Physiological obviousness of surgery, impact of patient and surgeon preference, lack of funding for surgical trials, methodological challenges of surgical trials, regulatory issues, this anxiety that surgical procedures are constantly evolving so that by the time the results of a long-time study are published, the procedure has become something else, and so no long, the surgery is no longer relevant. Groups continue to get together, like the group at Harvard got together. There was one uh, group of people who got together at Balliol College at Oxford uh, for a series of meetings. People here at McGill played key roles in this, Jeffrey Barkun and Jonathan Meekins, trying to look at this and say, what can we learn about surgical innovation and how can we do it properly? And so they come up with a set of ideal recommendations, a sort of nice acronym. Uh, and this is their table they publish in Lancet. Uh, and basically what it's a call for is methodological flexibility or, or open-mindedness. They'll say, no, there are a whole series of stages of a surgical innovation, idea development, exploration, assessment, long-term study. Randomized clinical trials do play a role in several stages of this. So they're not denying a role for randomized clinical trials. But again, it's relatively late in the life history of a surgical procedure, and it's alongside a whole series of other things case series, registry studies, routine databases. So it's really a call for flexibility. And I think we'll hear more about this kind of interest in flexible research designs in the talk this afternoon by Gerald Fried. As Chris has described, there has been in the 19, since the 1990s a renaissance in sham surgery, especially in orthopedics. Uh, and some people looking at this history will conclude, uh, like the Harvard group concluded in the early 1970s, the sham trials are really good at showing how bogus some surgical operations are, uh, and that we need to do RCTs for all of them. So the fact that many of these sham control trials have been negative proves how flawed surgical thinking is, and therefore we need to submit all surgery to sham trials. And you will occasionally see calls of someone saying we should do a sham controlled study of bypass surgery, and then the next sentence will say, but everyone knows that'll never happen. And so there's this, that happens every five years or so. Um, and they'll say, you know, the problem is surgeons are too enthusiastic. In the U.S., they succumb to financial conflicts of interest. Um, but this, this notion that since these trials are negative shows that all surgery is vulnerable is a misunderstanding of how trials have been used. Uh, these sham trials are really only done when there is huge a priori skepticism. Uh, there was a lot of concern about these procedures, uh, and it was that concern that triggered the RCT. Uh, and so sham trials are only done when they're likely to show no difference. That's not an indictment of surgery, it's just an indictment of the procedures that happen to get submitted to these sham trials. So it's, so it's an interesting thing. Uh, you have to be careful uh, about over-interpreting the results of this collection of negative trials. And so the assessment in the end, uh, this is my last slide, cannot be that surgeons have not bought into evidence-based medicine and there's something wrong with the culture of surgery that makes randomized trials anathema. Uh, it's not that surgeons are anti-intellectual. Uh, and this was the conclusion from the Harvard group in 1977. The reason is not that surgeons have been slow to accept new patterns of thought, but rather the very real conceptual, practical, ethical, and economic difficulties of carrying out in adequate numbers and sizes experiments involving complex surgical procedures in human beings. There, there was sympathy in the Harvard group that you know, this is a really difficult intellectual problem of randomized clinical trials in surgery. There are different cultures, yes, uh, but there are also different ways of knowing, different constraints, different opportunities. There are many, many differences between pharmaceuticals and operations. Uh, and so for reformers who think that more rigorous assessment is needed, you need to understand these dynamics. And one of the things that interests me is you know, how similar this conclusion is from 1977 to the conclusion of the Balliol group 30 years later. That, you know, it, you're dealing with a complex problem. Uh, you need to have complex thinking. Uh, 
And so instead of harping on surgeons for just not doing enough trials, uh, a more nuanced position would be to say, now, here are the reasons why it likely is appropriate uh, to be open to other methods in surgical research. Uh, and you need to think very specifically about exactly what RCTs have done and can do in surgery. Uh, so very interested in hearing your comments. Thank you. Well, I'm sure there are lots of comments. So, so it's interesting. We've heard a lot about uh, uh, randomized clinical trials, uh, where you put everybody into one big basket, you shake it, and you hope that you find uh, a unanimous answer. Uh, we know today, or we at least we think we know, that personalized medicine and precision medicine is really the way to go. And rather than putting everybody in a basket and hoping to find an answer, you need to individualize. And I'm wondering if we shouldn't go that direction more. And, and that's the kind of observation that has, I think, been the best argument for registry trials uh, on the grounds that you know, every patient is different. How, how do you do that? Putting people into groups isn't going to work. And they've tried very hard in these surgical trials uh, to try to find, to have inclusion criteria such that you, you can have clean groups of patients. Uh, but the minute you do that too thoroughly, you end up with problems of external validity. You, you end up with very pure abstract patient populations that aren't at all generalizable. And so surgeons have been very aware of that. And so they have argued that if you have registry trials, like if you did what the AO group wanted and had data of every person who had ever been submitted to this procedure, and you had been clever enough at the outset of the registry to record the right data fields, uh, which almost never happens, because people always realize 10 years in, oh, we should have recorded X, Y, or Z. Uh, but if you had the ideal data set in a comprehensive registry, then you ought to be able to make progress to answer the kind of question that you're asking. Uh, the statisticians are, are split on that. There's some people who say, well, no. It, the, the way that our, an, our statistical analytics are set up, you really need randomization. Now there are these ways that they do randomized trials off of registries. There was one that was published a couple of years ago uh, where they randomly selected patients out of a registry data set and then analyzed them. Uh, and it was one of the quickest, cheapest randomized trials that has been ever been, it's like, it's like they did it over a weekend with a good computer guy. Uh, and so time will tell how, how well those will, will sink in. Uh, the real challenge is trying to figure out, you know, what information do you want? Like, you know, you could say, well, for these surgical outcomes, uh, maybe operator skill isn't the most relevant outcome. Maybe there are differences in tissue healing. I mean, presumably there are differences in tissue healing. There are differences over people's age, like the, the ability of a coronary anastomosis to heal smoothly in a 40-year-old is presumably different than it is in a 90-year-old, and it's surely different if the person is a smoker or a non-smoker. Uh, and there must be millions of genetic alleles that will somehow be identified that will be relevant for these things. Uh, so d should all these registries have full genome sequencing? I mean, at some point, you end up drowning in data that you can't interpret. Uh, and so I think there's, there's active research trying to solve that problem, but it's not going to be an easy problem to solve. Actually, this has been going on in a stepwise fashion. You don't just go from large groups to personalized. For example, in the 1970s, when we learned about the existence and the role of the estrogen receptor, we immediately did trials uh, on estrogen positive patients that were different from estrogen receptor negative patients using tamoxifen and subsequent drugs. We did the same thing in the late 90s with the Herceptin and the HER2 growth factor. The minute these things became apparent, you could devise a trial for that group of patients and devise a treatment for them. How far down that slope you'll go to individual patients uh, is an interesting qu question, and then you raise a good point. I don't know where we'll get to with that. But uh, to, to, to continue on what you say, if you put her two estrogen positive negative patients all of in one basket, of course you will not find results. So, so somewhere, I don't know if we shouldn't let go of that myth of randomized controlled trials in order to get answers. Well, we still got a randomized controlled trial to get an answer about Herceptin, but we focused on patients who carried the HER2 growth factor amplification. You took it down to one variable. Yes. 
question here. Um, so I think. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, so I think you focused on uh, RCTs that debunked dying surgical procedures. I was wondering about um, RCTs that didn't. So positive RCTs, I guess. Um, Tomas and I have worked on the RCT that was done here by uh, Dr. Freed and Sigmund and Meekins and uh, Barkin on um, Lab Coley. And that turned out to be a positive RCT and it didn't really have an impact. Is that an anomaly in surgical RCTs? As I said, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm looking for more examples to help flesh out that sort of thing. Uh, and there, there are positive trials that have been done. The, even though, like, you know, what's more common, a negative trial or a positive trial? I, I don't, it's hard to find these things to get a good answer to that question. Uh, but even when there are positive trials, again, the positive trials are, are done relatively late. And the lab quality had, had been established before these trials are done. Uh, the relative, the, the question of non-impact, and in some ways that story is similar to the cabbage trial. Now, if people, by the time a study, is, uh, by the time a procedure is established, and this is, and this gets back to one of the concerns that Thomas Chalmers had in 1972, that if you humor surgeons and give them a couple years to work with a procedure in community practice so that they can optimize it fully, and then submit it to a trial, uh, it's too late. You know, the, the horse is out of the barn. There'll be not just surgeon preference, but there'll be patient preference, uh, and. That makes it hard to accrue patients. And there have been studies that have looked at, as people try to understand why there are so few surgical RCTs that have been done, uh, it's not just that the initiation rate of randomized, of RCTs in surgery is lower than in pharmaceuticals, but the completion rate is also much, much lower. And so there's a much higher rate of non-completion of surgical RCTs, mostly because of problems of patient accrual, and that's mostly blamed on questions of surgeon and patient preference, which gets blamed on the fact that the procedure has been in use for several years before you do the trial. Uh, and I, I don't know a way around that dynamic. Uh, in some ways, you know, the argument I made was a bit of a tautology. You know, RCTs successfully kill off procedures for which there's skepticism, uh, procedures for which there's faith, like some laparoscopic procedures or like bypass surgery, endure negative RCTs. Uh, well, then what's the, what's the source, source of faith or lack of faith in these procedures? Uh, and you, then you need to have a, a very idiosyncratic history of the development of this particular procedure. So I, I can describe them. It's easy to describe the sources of faith in cabbage. Uh, it was easy to describe the sources of skepticism for IMA ligation. It just it made no sense in terms of fluid dynamics. Uh, so it goes back to these phys physiological understandings. One thank more you. question. Yeah, uh, thank you again for your bimodal approach to the validation of what they do. One is a positive and one is a negative. You have a trial of drugs. You understand where that's going, and I like that approach. But I find that in surgery, we have equipment that exists, and then the equipment then is, people are in search for the utilization for that equipment for other things as much as possible. And my colleague on the side here, who is one of the experts in Da Vinci, he knows that for a fact. I mean, now everybody thinks you can use a Da Vinci for carpal tunnel syndrome. I mean, you use it for everything because that's how people look at equipment. And I think that's where one of the premises of problems exists in our society. But the one thing I also want to talk about quickly, because we have a discussion here about subset analysis, is exactly right. We do trials many times. And then we end up saying, well, we'll do a subset analysis because the trial itself didn't pan out like we wanted it. <laughs> and one of the most interesting examples of that was that the, the first, the 1977 VA trial of bypass surgery. Uh, so they, they enrolled people with a wide range of coronary disease, single, double, triple vessel disease. And they had realized relatively early on, I think it was 1975, on subgroup analyses that the people who had left main disease actually were benefiting. So they pulled that out and published that separately. So that result came out 75 or 76. So if you have really bad coronary disease, you ought to have cabbage done. Uh, and then they published the full results, including that subgroup in 77, the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and the trial gets critiqued fiercely by surgeons, uh, to which people like Spodek and Chalmers and others say, well, this is interesting. 
they're fiercely attacking the results of the trial as they relate to patients with single and double vessel disease, but they're not attacking the results of the same trial for triple vessel disease. Uh, and so these people are, just, are basically, the critics are total hypocrites. They're, they're trumpeting the fact that the trial proved the value of bypass surgery for triple vessel disease, and they're assailing the fact that the same trial failed to show the value of single and double, like you, you can't have it both ways. Uh, and so that sh shows up early in this history. Uh, and then there's, you know, again, the, the trial statisticians are always saying, you know, subgroup analysis, especially post hoc subgroup analysis, is just a totally suspect way of thinking. Uh, and so surgeons, if you look at surgical trials now, you know, they're, they're always very careful to say, you know, what the primary endpoints are and what the secondary endpoints are. And they'll, sometimes you'll see them say, uh, you know, on the outcomes de defined in advance, the trial did or didn't work. But then we also produced, we found these other outcomes and they'll, they'll try to slip them in and sometimes journals will allow them to report outcomes that weren't part of the trial design and some journals will say, you, you can't do that, that's you know, data mining. Uh, so it's very hard to know what the right, right way to do it. So again, you, you, if you could stratify uh, by all the relevant parameters at the outset, then you could do, happily do these thorough subgroup analyses after the fact, but then you would need enormous studies, uh, and for a whole series of reasons that aren't that hard to imagine, it's hard to do enormous clinical trials. Uh, and what, again, one, one of the questions I've been trying to figure out, like, what's the largest RCT of a surgery that's ever been done? Uh, some of the multi-center trials do get up to several thousand patients. Uh, uh, so there are big trials, there's just not very many of them. Richard? Just wanted to put a little footnote on your observation about the uh, trial actually confirming what people were beginning to think. When we were doing the <coughs> segmental versus total mastectomy trial, some of the colleagues here in this hospital refused to participate in the trial. But I noticed that they were beginning to do the partial mastectomy on their own. So I actually got out the data and did a graph and showed explicitly that permission to do the operation arrived when the protocol was active. And you could see that no segmental mastectomies were done until, I think that's 1975 when we started the trial, and then they began to increase at, at a remarkable rate. And I, actually, I couldn't get it published because I couldn't get enough patients by getting my colleagues in the NSABP to do the same thing in their hospitals. But the subtitle for what I would have published was a paraphrase of Marshall McLuhan, the protocol is the message. And, and so, 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 that, so, so the observation is that the fact that the trial was being done reassured surgeons yeah. that they well, could switch. Nobody did a segmental mastectomy in this hospital until the trial was open. And then surgeons began to do it and they weren't putting the patients in the trial. They'd be doing them on their own. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's hard, my, my, I, I think my sense was that there was a similar dynamic uh, with the gastric freezing. As people realized these trials were being done, then it was okay to be skeptical because the trials were being done. So again, they're, they're interesting positive yeah. feedback loops. It shaped camps too. There were people, there were a few defenders, but many more antagonists to the procedure. And they kind of formed these, there were a dozen of trials that were done in the 60s. And they, they created these. Uh, communities of people who disagreed with the idea of gastric freezing. And one of the things that has been clear from the early studies in the 1970s of this, the, what's now called the un unwarranted variation uh, is that the focus has been on surgery. I think this is true in all areas of medicine, that you know, lo local thought leaders have a huge impact on local practice. practice. And whether it's you know, a residency director who shapes the practice of all the residents who pass through uh, or prominent people in the community. Uh, and because of the, these social judgments that get passed, you, you can see these tip, tipping points happen quickly where all, there'll, there'll be a, a change and then people just start piling on. Uh, and so you, you can get changes in practice that relate to the social dynamics in the surgical community that aren't unrelated to either active trials or results of trials, but aren't totally driven by the actual evidence. There are other dynamics that are clearly in play. Uh, and one of the things I always I wondered about as well, and this was an observation that uh, I heard from Fred Loop, who had been one of the cardiac surgeons in Cleveland, in Cleveland at the outset and then was CEO for a very long time. Uh, so I probably interviewed him around 2009 or so. Uh, you know, he was complaining about obsession with clinical trials, as all the Cleveland surgeons have done. Uh, but he was also commenting about you know, the, the irrelevance of the old data. Uh, and so you know, 
the current indications of bypass surgery, more or less now, are based on these trials that were done in the late 70s, uh, where smoking rates in the United States were far higher than they are today. Uh, and he, he, you know, he just said flat out, he said, you know, in his experience operating roughly from 67, I think he stopped operating around 1980, his observation was that coronary artery disease changed as smoking rates fell. It's a different disease in smokers than in non-smokers. Uh, and so we have all this evidence base that's irrelevant because the population has changed. Uh, and so we ought to do all these new studies. And then you'll, you'll see this in drug trials as well. Uh, because the standard of care of pharmaceutical treatment, especially for coronary disease, has changed a lot, it's not clear the relevance of this old data. So people will say, well, uh, statins have clearly changed, or statin believers will say that statins have clearly altered the natural history of atherosclerosis. And so studies of surgical procedures of atherosclerosis should really be marked by, was this a pre-statin or a post-statin, a pre-smoking, post-statin? Uh, and there was, a, there was a series of studies published uh, last week in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this, you know, this is one of the areas for where there's been long-standing debate, you know, carotid endarterectomy. Uh, there were debates in the 80s and 90s about carotid endarterectomy versus medical treatment. Now the, the studies were done comparing surgical endarterectomy to stents. Uh, and most of them now are non-equivalent studies. Uh, and there's this interesting comment uh, where they say, well, you know, in, in hindsight, instead of just comparing surgical endarterectomy to stenting, we ought to have had a medical control arm. Uh, and other people said, you really ought to have had a placebo control arm as well. But in any case, we ought to have had a political control arm. And the editorial comments about this, uh, and they said, well, you know, that at the time the study was begun, the, the current improvements in medical therapy weren't fully on board. Uh, and it's mostly referenced to, to statins and other things. Uh, but now what's happened is that because medical management has gotten so good, again, the disease is different than it used to be. Uh, and so we really ought to like, you know, start from scratch. Uh, and, and such a moving target, uh, not just a question of the, innov the innovation of the surgical procedures, but the, cha the changes over time and actually the disease substrate that surgeons are trying to tackle. Uh, it makes it very, very hard to know how to do good knowledge production in this setting. Again, the ideal registry would solve a lot of this if you knew, if you had the right data in, the, in your registry. Harvey, last comment? Continue. You, you mentioned the, the dynamics that go into producing all these studies. So I think there are studies that are one-time things. You want to prove something, yes or no. But I think that the confidence that the surgeons have to have in the study group is very, very important. It's hard to develop that confidence with one or two studies. I think some of the things that have happened with, for example, the breast groups is the breast groups doing the studies have been sustainable and over a period of time. And eventually, I think a confidence builds up that surgeons say, you know what, they're not really against us. We're really trying to move things forward. And you get a greater acceptance. Now, that doesn't mean it's across the board. I think you get a general acceptance by major players that then change the whole dynamic. General acceptance of the method of randomized trials, or of the acceptance of the procedure itself. Well, acceptance of the of the group that's producing it, saying that we have confidence in them, and we're going to look at what they say, and perhaps things will not be uh, bad, but actually move forward. Well, thanks to every to the speakers and to everybody for a very lively discussion, and uh, lunch break is.